Yeah, we are recording now. Fantastic. So this is uh, the case presentation take two. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, we're going to have to repeat some of that because of um, an unfortunate incident. But it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll go through and, and start again. So again, it's uh, welcome to Oxford. Welcome to my living room. Welcome to the wind. Welcome to the British summer. Uh, it's a very beautiful way to um, to, 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 to do a, a teaching session. It's very millennial, something that I'm not very familiar with. And as we were saying earlier, this is the smartest we've ever been for the last two months and not walking around in our vests and jeans. So nicely clean shaven, etc. So it's really good. And just to reiterate, here's my COVID hairstyle, which my niece is loving at the moment. So I'm going to get everyone to sort of do the introductions whilst I get the talk prepared. We'll start off from the Sunshine State. Uh, ladies first, let's go with Eleanor. Hi, my name is Elena Vitrian, and I am uh, originally from Spain and currently living and working in uh, Miami, uh, in Florida. I uh, originally trained in Barcelona, did my medical school and my ophthalmology residency. Then I went uh, for fellowship at uh, UCLA in Los Angeles. And then I repeated a residency again in the United States. And I work um, as a consultant at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota where I did uh, adult glaucoma and pediatric glaucoma. I am currently now working at Pascom Palmer in uh, Miami, and I am also uh, both a pediatric and glaucoma specialist, most of my practice being adult, but still enjoying the challenges of uh, caring for the little ones. And thank you uh, for the invitation today to be with you guys to, in this panel. Hi everyone, my name is Paul Healy. I'm um, from Sydney, uh, I trained it in Sydney and uh, did a fellowship in glaucoma at uh, Moorfields um, before returning to Sydney where I've been since. I uh, look after adult glaucoma. Um, I'm also affiliated with Sydney University and have an interest in um, epidemiology, uh, public health. Um, also uh, done, run a lab for quite a few years in um, wound healing research uh, related to glaucoma surgery where we're still doing a little bit of work. Um, and um, some genetic epidemiology as well. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Raj and Taylor. Um, currently a consultant with um, GERG in Oxford Eye Hospital. Um, I did my um, glaucoma training in London at Moorfields Eye Hospital, probably some years after Paul. Um, <laughs> uh, but all the same mentors and we probably learned the same things. In fact, all of us, even GERG has. Um, it's, it was a pleasurable two years and um, I've been a consultant now for two years in glaucoma. So thank you for the invite. Yeah, my name is uh, Maria. I am the, I was the uh, ophthalmology fellow at Oxford University and I trained uh, previously in Spain. Now I'm finishing my PhD in Clinica Universidad de Navarra and uh, we really hope you enjoy this part of the uh, of this fantastic webinar great so i'm just going to do the screen share just now and just a little whilst i'm doing that just to say that let's go from the start is um that um the last person we saw there was Maria, who's got the little footnote on the, on the advert, but actually she's put in a tremendous amount of work uh, in organising, helping prepare the talk and making this happen. Um, she, she, she's been doing fantastic work, so we thank Maria. And as a paediatric fellow, she'll be leading the ped section of the talk. So the first thing, the last person to introduce, as I did before, was Tom, who um, was called the shadow. He shadowed me everywhere on the football field. After lockdown, he shadowed me in clinic and theatre. I told him about this talk and then I lost my shadow. But thank you very much, Tom, for helping us uh, uh, prepare this talk. So I've got a gorgeous talk here about a case that we saw, which is a hypotony post FACO. I'm gonna talk about a case, a little bit about the pathogenesis and medical management, and then we'll get our teeth stuck into our passion um, as ophthalmologists uh, is the surgical approach. Uh, which would be initially non-invasive approaches, then following on with more surgical approaches and novel approaches. And then we'll have an advert for the program for next week. So this is an 82-year-old Indian gentleman who had a trabi about nine years ago. And unfortunately, the trabi scarred. He had a flat leb. And we call it a qualified success because he required dual therapy to bring the pressure down. 
of course, anybody who has any type of ocular surgery will have an accelerated cataract. And this is exactly what happened to this gentleman with reduced vision due to this cataract. And on the slit lamp at the beginning of prior to surgery, I thought, look, there's no point in trying to salvage the blood with a 5FU. There was just absolutely no flow. So we decided just to do the cataract surgery. It was done under my team. Um, it was my senior fellow doing the operation. And it was a fairly long operation, took about 45 minutes or so. And in the post-operative phase, um, we looked at, there was a bit of corneal edema. So I increased the steroids. And unfortunately, that's when the, um, the COVID situation started. So we said that we'd see him um, in, in due course. Um, but then he popped up to casualty a couple of months later. And the casualty officers saw him um, and they were worried about retinal detachment, which they excluded. Um, at that time, he was still on the prostaglandin, which they stopped. So generally, I don't ever stop prostaglandins uh, postoperatively unless they're diabetic or have a propensity developing CMO. Can the panel please comment on that? I agree. I don't uh, routinely stop prostaglandins and the setting of uh, uncomplicated cataract surgeries. If there is a complication, broken capsule, I would consider if the patient has some uh, underlying risk factors like uh, diabetic macular edema, or something like this, then I would. But routinely, I don't. I do agree with you. Thanks, Elena. Uh, I, I agree with that as well. I think the only time I would stop it is if there was a PC rupture because of the increased risk of CMO. And, and, and the patients that I've seen who are pseudophagic on a prostaglandin with CMO usually get an idiosyncratic reaction to it, which may be years and years down the line causing CMO. So I agree with Elena that I wouldn't stop a prostaglandin post-op. Yeah, and I'd agree too. I mean, the reality, you know, your good cataract surgery will be spoilt by a high post-operative pressure. Um, and uh, when your patient has a serious um, optic neuropathy, um, you need to keep it under control. Um, sometimes, of course, if particularly in a PXF patient, uh, if you get a substantial pressure drop, then you can revise your medications afterwards. But, you know, always assume the worst before you hope for the best in glaucoma. It's usually a safer way to travel. Fantastic. So preoperatively, uh, the patient had 612 vision, but he presented with 618. And I saw him a couple of days later, and this was the picture. He had a shallow AC in the right eye with a flat as a pancake bleb, but no leak and certainly wasn't overdraining. The eye was white and quiet, so certainly there was no ciliary body shutdown, but he was hypotenuse. And you can see there from the B scan and the optos, there was almost kissing choroidal. So I'm going to ask then for a UBM. And what we found was this. So Rajan, can I just get your thoughts on the, so we go uh, for um, the thoughts on uh, the differential diagnosis. Uh, do you think that the old trabeculectomy has has a, has a, has a has a sway in this? Um, thanks, Bill. Um, I think this the, the differential will be either an overdraining bleb or um, a, a, so a hypotony which can either be caused by an overdraining bleb bleb in this patient or um, um, a cleft and. And the, the, the facts that kind of sway me away from an overdraining bleb, our bleb is flat. Um, and it was flat pre op, so it's unlikely you're going to resurrect a flat bleb by doing a FACO. Sometimes you can, um, but clinically, if the bleb looked flat post op, then it's unlikely to be an overdraining bleb. Um, the other thing is that um, if you look at the UBM, what's very interesting is that you can see, um, I don't know if you can see the arrow coming up on the screen, but if you look at the the, um, the um, uh, scleral spur, if you look um, beyond that more posterior, you can actually see that the ciliary body looks detached um, and it's very anterior fluid, so which makes you think there may be a cleft there. Um, uh, and um, so I think putting those two things together, I'd probably more, be more inclined to say this was a cleft rather than an overdraining bleb. And Why is the cleft not so visible on the UBM at this stage? Why would you? Yeah, that's a really good question. And the, the thing is that, um, you know, we don't, when we do a UBM, we, don't, we can't exactly image 360 degrees, you know, without missing a clock hour sometimes. And the other thing is that because the eyes, the pressure in the eye is low, the eye might be soft. And so the cleft might have closed because of the low pressure in the eye. 
So the two things together, the low pressure in the eye and the fact that you may not capture every single clock hour with UVM, you may miss a cleft. Fantastic. So that's exactly what I thought. It was a ciliary body cleft. And so just to reiterate exactly what that is, it's essentially it forms from momentary axial compression and that force is transmitted to the equator. So it's usually after trauma and you get a detachment or a separation of the ciliary body from the scleral spur. And what that does, it leads to a fistula whereby there's a direct pathway for aqueous humor to go into the supracroidal space. And that overcomes the usual hydrostatic and osmotic forces, which keeps in a physiological position, both structures opposed. Now, the patient presented um, with reduced vision and actually I took the opportunity of being now the EPR guru where I can now access EPR from my home. I looked up his phone number and called the patient and I probed him for a, for a history of trauma which he denied. So which we thought the iatrogenic fact that he had a trabi before might have had a, an impact but essentially he came in with reduced vision. So you can get re refractive error in clefts whereby the celery body detaches, it looses the zonule and the lenticular complex move is anterior, so you get induced myopia. Also, as you've alluded to, there's a soft eye being squished between uh, your eyelids, which in causes, with the rule, astigmatism. But the main source of visual morbidity is that with hypotenuse maculopathy, you get distortion and misalignment of the photoreceptors. Now, this is probably the most crucial um, slide because how do you diagnose a cleft? Well, it's bloody difficult. Uh, the reason being, as you've said, um, in a soft eye, you might miss the clefts, but also they might be micro clefts or oblique clefts. And it's very tricky to put a gonioscope on a patient who's already stressed out because they've got poor vision and a soft eye. But what you're trying to see is a white band of sclera visible in the region of the ciliary body. So th the point is in this tricky situation, you need adjuncts. Some authors have said give midriatic because they deepen the chamber and facilitate visualization. Others have said use myotics because so they open the angle and then hence the cleft. So Elena, can I just ask your thoughts? Um, which adjuncts would you use? Do you insert visco prior to gonia? And would you do that on a slit lamp, for example? So I tried to do my gonioscopy without any ad um, agents. I uh, assess first the level of pressure, the level of depth of the anterior chamber. If the eye is too soft I, and the patient is resistant, I'm not going to exert the extra pressure on the eye to lower the pressure further and I will just like defer that, that part of the exam. If the uh, chamber is formed, I would go ahead and go with my gonioprism without any medications. If I had to choose a medication between mydriatic and myotic, I would choose a mydriatic because it's mm -hmm. a treatment because it's uh, somehow it, it might allow us to, to see a little bit better. Uh, in terms of um, viscoelastic, uh, if the uh, angle, uh, if the anterior chamber is too soft, it makes sense to reform the anterior chamber with viscoelastic. However, I tend not to do this injection at the slit lamp. Usually it's pretty painful. Uh, the eye is very, very sensitive and uh, Patients don't, don't, don't love that that much. However, if I do think I need to obtain uh, more information, I would do an exam and that anesthesia on this patient, like bring them to a procedure room with the patient laying down. Uh, we can go with, like, with a needle and inject uh, in the anterior chamber. If the anterior chamber is too shallow, I would inject a little bit of BSS first to, to create more room and then inject the, the viscoelastic afterwards. Um, in children, obviously, we do have to do exams under anesthesia. Uh, there are cases we recently had an 18-month-old baby uh, with a um, iatrogenic uh, induced uh, cleft uh, of one hour. So she had a, a congenital glaucoma. She had an angle procedure uh, with an omni instrument, which is uh, uh, opening the creating uh, opening the Schlem's canal, and the instrument can occasionally create a cleft. So this baby, we had this, uh, the case that she had a cleft. She's like a baby that rubs her eye. So that she had an extremely shallow anterior chamber. So this case, we took her to the operating room. We did inject this elastic intraoperatively, and that allows us to do a gonioscopy, identify the cleft, and also do the uh, UVM. That was not possible to do when the eye is too soft. So that's, but in the slit lamp, I mean, I think you have to pick your uh, cases uh, to inject viscoelastic. Most of, our, most of my patients, I don't think they would really tolerate this. 
Fantastic. So let's go down under. Paul, can you just um, allude on what Elena said and talk a little bit about further investigations, including UBM and anterior segment OCT, whether it's synergistic or etc. Sure. Um, I'm just looking at your slide, which says uh, gonioscopy sensitivity 40%. And that's a paper uh, from India. I know Ramanjit Sahota very well, and she's an extremely accomplished um, ophthalmologist and clinician. Uh, and so the reason that she's only going to find a 40% uh, sensitivity on gonioscopy is because of exactly what we've heard, the, the, the shallowness of the chamber, the fact that um, uh, sacrodialyses that are surgically induced are often superior. Uh, remember, if you want to create a sacrodialysis, you need to tug the iris. And a good way to tug the iris is to do a trabeculectomy, not terribly, or rather do the peripheral erodectomy not very well. So you do sometimes find, and I don't think this is your case, but you sometimes find that patient with an excellent post-operative trab pressure with no bleb for many years, who then goes on to have a cataract and gets hypotonia afterwards because the small cyclodialysis cleft that was curative of his glaucoma becomes a big one, which becomes pathological. But getting back to uh, that slide and the, and the poor sensitivity of gonioscopy, it's because you've got this uh, distorted anterior uh, chamber. And really, you know, the, the, there are two main advantages of UBM. Um, UBM is not that useful in actual fact at finding clefts. Um, this is a great example of publication bias, right? It's when you have the UBMs that show the cleft that you write the paper demonstrating it. But frequently, it is very hard, as you said, to get every clock hour as you're going around. What UBM does, it shows you the supraciliary fluid, which we saw in that previous slide. So that helps you with your diagnosis, and particularly that characteristic uh, fluid sitting very anteriorly tells you that the cleft is the cause. Um, the other advantage is that the patient's lying down, uh, certainly for the old fashioned UBMs in an in immersion bath. And when you lie down, the lens and iris diaphragm falls backwards and the uh, cleft opens up. So, really, the best way to see a cleft is with gonioscopy with the patient lying down, um, but you're going to do that under the operating microscope in the theatre. And that's really, really important if you're going to do some, some surgery from, for this. So I think, you know, the rule of thumb for the trainee's point of view is that when you, when I come to see this patient, they're going to have been dilated because the resident's going to want to um, excluded the retinal detachment, which is very sensible, or the large, you know, um, traumatic, um, traumatic um, retinal dialysis. Uh, so you've got a dilated pupil. You do attempt to perform gonioscopy as carefully as you can. Um, if the cleft is huge, then it's easy to find. And it's also easy to see on UBM and it's also easy to see on a ASOCT and it doesn't really add very much. If the cleft is very, very small and it's very hard to see on gonioscopy, then the UBM, when you look at the, where the fluid is, particularly if it's in early days, you might get a clue that, you know, it's a superior quadrant that's got the most or inferior quadrant that's got the most, um, but it's really ancillary. Um, I think if you use viscoelastic at the slit lamp, then you're probably gonna get as good a view as you are lying the patient down you doing UBM. Um, and even if you use the UBM and you, find what you think is the cleft, you've got to clinically confirm it before you actually do any procedure to fix it. So useful, but not, you know, as an adjunct, adjunct only. Fantastic. That's really useful. So I think already the panel have mentioned something that I want to have as a take home message is you must categorize the size of the clefts. It definitely has an impact on the management and start thinking about clock hours to try to diagnose them. So this is a paradigm that I want to talk about, essentially in terms of management. We always start off with non-invasive things first. The first type of thing to think about is medical treatment. And if we don't respond to that, then we move on to non-invasive treatment. I will be talking about argon laser, cryo and diode in its many guises. And then we move on to invasive therapy like surgical cyclopexy, viti and, my, and endoscopic surgery as well. So I chose this paper because it gave me hope, hope in, uh, in managing my patient. And I think Paul's already alluded to that sometimes you can develop clefts either through trauma or iatrogenic and they lay latent. They are latent clefts and then the phaco opens them up. 
So this paper showed that if you have a post phaco cleft, 60% of them resolved with medical therapy. I looked back at this paper last night and they didn't actually speak about the size of the cleft, which um, uh, was difficult to gauge how much to take from this paper, but certainly it gave me some, um, some hope. So we talked about medical therapy. What type of medical therapy is there? We've alluded to it already, but let's go into depths of it. So this is not just my post gym selfie, but it's also a reminder to say that uh, we want to talk about steroids and the role of steroids is debatable. It can either raise ocular pressure and reduce choroidal effusion, or conversely, some people say it hinders the healing process that co causes closure of the fistula. So can the panel um, start discussing, uh, starting off, off with Rajan, would you just decrease the dexamethasone or increase it? Um, I, I personally wouldn't start them on it, um, just for the reasons that you mentioned, because you want apposition between the um, ciliary body and scleral spur, and you want, want inflammation to induce healing. So hence my reason for, if the patient's on it, I would quickly taper it and stop it, or even just stop it. Um, and, and if they're not on it, I wouldn't start them on steroids for that reason. Agreed. And usually, uh, do steroids. Uh, usually, it's in the context of trauma. We have context of trauma or, or surgery, like this case, the patient is surgery. I usually bump it up a little bit and then uh, taper it down. I know it's not proven. I know it's uh, medically the main treatment is uh, atropine, like a mitratic, uh, for a, uh, to achieve a position. But I usually, I think that helps a bit. Another uh, issue is on children. On children, I think it's particularly important to give some steroids because they have an extraordinary level of inflammation. They ha can have uh, exudative retinal detachments and not just uvl effusions, but, but they could do this. And How so would you deliver the steroids, Elena? How would you really deliver it? So, a good question. So, topically at least, like some prednisolone, uh, like six times a day on, on children. Uh, we had, uh, the case I mentioned recently was, there was a problem with compliance. And we did uh, give a canalog, for example, in this case, when we think that the baby is not going to get it. Children occasionally would need a systemic steroids on, on some cases, not routinely. Uh, but definitely the prednisolone topically, yes, I, I do give this. Yeah. And, and in yeah. adults, as we said, if this patient had a recent surgery, I would probably prolong it a, a tiny bit more, yeah, but, but keep the, the atropine. And, and then, can I just ask, did you give the canalog subtenons? Yes. Okay. Correct. For this baby, yes. And I don't do it routinely. It was just because we knew we had a, a compliance problem with, it, with this patient. Oh. But yeah, it's octinone, correct. Okay. So, the most bellissimo occhio a causa di una goccia si chiama atropine. So, atropine, uh, as already mentioned, it allows apposition of the detached meridional uh, ciliary muscle to the sclera. So the next question really is, is that there is a general thought, and I think Ormerod uh, actually reported this, that you get better uh, prognosis if you restore IOP and close the cleft within two months. But there's been other authors which say that even decades beyond the original trauma and cleft, there's significant recovery in terms of pressure, vision, if you do close the cleft even then. So some people say it's never too late to try. Elena, can I just ask, starting from you, how long would you persist with atropine before moving on to the next level? So it depends a lot on the case. Um, if the patient obviously is monocular, uh, that's his only eye, the vision is so poor, I wouldn't uh, hold on on a medical therapy that I'm not seeing results that often. If the patient is, uh, sees with both eyes, I, I tend to wait a little bit more. If I do see some progress, uh, I do see that the AC is getting a little deeper, the pressure is, then I hold on on medical therapy. A lot of times it's a matter of waiting and then that cleft can, uh, depends on the extension obviously, but uh, it can seal by, by itself. So, so th those cases I wait a little bit, but I see the whole patient, like uh, what, what's the visual status on the other eye? What am I seeing? I'm following closely. Uh, do I see any progress or things that some eyes are even getting worse? So that, that's the, but I, uh, if I see some progress, yes, a couple of months I would wait. Um, they said, uh, it is said that when we have a hypotonic maculopathy, it's good to revise it, yeah, within the first three months, ideally. And that is great if it's your case. Uh, you've done the surgery, you watch them from day zero. Sometimes we get those patients as a referral and they've been uh, out like for five, six months. 
um, is, is it still good to pursue treatment? Um, a lot of times the, the photoreceptors are not damaged. If you fix, a, even if it's a cleft or if it's a leaking blab or like an overfiltering blab, a lot of times you can see, I, you know, in, in different scenario, but in a overfiltering blab, I had a eight year um, patient with hypotenuse, documented hypotenuse maculopathy that I fix and that again vision, like a like significant vision. So I think you should pursue treatment for everyone. Medically, uh, I do like, I started right away. And I, if I see that things are steady or maintaining, I, I would continue it for like a couple of months. If I see we're going nowhere or things are getting worse, then no, then I, I would pursue a little bit. Uh, something. A whole couple of months, is that a similar time frame? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I think we just need to step back and, and add a little bit of perspective. I mean, you know, the, the question you haven't asked, of course, is why does hypotony get sent to glaucoma doctors? Right. I mean, we don't know anything about hypotony. Um, <laughs> the, the other thing, and, you know, you didn't mention this when you showed the photograph, is that, you know, the only thing that concerns me about a cyclodialysis cleft is hypotony maculopathy. Right. I mean, if this patient had no maculopathy, I mean, those choroidals are pretty big and actually unusually large for a cyclodialysis cleft. You didn't mention that either. And, you know, Obviously, I think what's happened is that the hypotony generated by the cyclodesis cleft has just, you know, pinched off those vortex veins and probably created a choroidal effusion as well. But given the fact that most of my patients and probably most of your patients have no vision in that area where the choroidal attachment is anyway, um, you know, if they've only got a few points left on their 10 degree field and this is their only eye and the pressure is two or three and the macula is perfectly flat, you know, this isn't a problem that needs to be necessarily needs to be solved. We've got to remember that as late as 1976, there are papers in the literature by respect, highly respected glaucoma surgeons using cyclodialysis as a treatment for glaucoma to lower mm. intraocular pressure, mm -hmm. right? And what we know about what happens when cyclodialysis cleft closes is mostly because of those iatrogenic cyclodialysis cleft used to control intraocular pressure. And, you know, the reason we don't use them these days, um, although we did very briefly with the Cypass, was because, you know, either they work too well and you get hypotonic complications in the, uh, in the macula, or mostly they close. So I think, again, the important teasing message is for these sorts of clefts, the ones that happen post cataract surgery that are almost certainly, you know, post cataract surgery without major iris trauma, there are almost certainly tiny clefts which have been opened up by the FACO, by the pressure of the fluid. Um, they almost always get better with conservative therapy. And um, the, one of the things you've got to think about with this guy uh, is, you know, you're going to start him on atrium and you're going to send him home and you're going to say to him, when you wake up in the middle of the night with that really bad headache, give us a call because the pressure will be 60 and yeah. you know, the eye is going to get worse glaucoma damage. If this is a trauma where you've got a, a, you know, a massive big hole, then, you know, the ch I mean, if you can see, you know, if, if you atropinize a patient and you put the gonadal lens on and you can see, still see a great big, you know, semi lunate hole there, um, it's not likely to get better by itself. And I, and I think that's when we need to move to surgery and you've already, um, um, you know, suggested that in, in the way you're classifying the clefts. Um, so the smaller ones, which are most of them, definitely conservative therapy, at least two months, uh, maybe up to three, depending on the state of the macula. Um, big clefts, usually with pressures of zero and bad hypotony need surgery. Um, and if you've got a small cleft and you've got um, a, a low pressure, but you don't have hypotony, remember hypotony is a syndrome, not a number, right? So examine the eye. If there's no hypotony, it doesn't matter if the pressure is two or three. If it's bad glaucoma, leave it alone. Maybe get the patient to wear a shield at night. Perfect. Okay. No, that's fantastic. So I'm just going to, we've already said that there's no preferential location for clefts. So the key thing is, is to mark the cleft after identification. It's difficult, we've already said, uh, because you're reliant on the person doing UBM and there might be multiple clefts. But nevertheless, just for the purpose of the t a talk, let's make some assumptions. Assume it's a small cleft. Assume medical therapy has not been uh, 
successful and there's only one cleft, what are our options? Well, I'm going to start looking at different papers and different, different concepts and we'll look off first at uh, argon laser versus surgery. So this paper looked at patients over a period of nine years, all following blunt trauma. Now the patients had options of either having laser or surgery after risks and benefits were discussed, but it so happened, it transpired, it was a coincidence that the larger clefts were managed by surgery. The laser was applied on both sides of the cleft, ciliary muscle and scleral side. And what it showed was that argon laser had reasonably good success. And in fact, if the cleft was less than 1.45 clock hours, it was almost identical or similar to the surgical success uh, um, via direct cyclopexy. So can I just get the panel's thought on argon laser and settings? Paul, why don't you start? Um, I like laser. I like um, argon and diode laser for treating clefts. Um, firstly, we're all familiar with it. We use it all the time. We're comfortable doing it. Um, cryotherapy, you know, I did two intracaps in my training. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't consider myself experienced using cryotherapy. Some of our older colleagues are very experienced. Um, but, I, you know, I, I find it a little bit... Um, a little bit uh, vicious and, and violent on the eye. The other nice thing about the laser, of course, is that we know its effects. You know, we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to cause some coagulation and that coagulation creates, you know, coagulated byproducts, which in, incite a wound healing response. And that's why I, I don't use steroids to treat these, unless the patient's got a raging, you know, uveitis, then obviously you may need a bit of steroid to calm it down. But, you know, what you've got here is a wound and you want the wound healing response to close it. The other nice thing about argon uh, is that it does, I mean, not all cases, but I've had a few where it's, it closes it quite gently. So what happens is it, you laser deep into the uh, cleft, you're trying to hit the muscle, you know, laser in the sclera doesn't do much, does it, right? It doesn't absorb the laser, um, you don't mm -hmm. get much reaction, it's not a very reactive tissue. But lasering the, the, the muscle at the edge of the sclera, um, you then get some, um, uh, exudate, you then get an inflammatory response. And if you're lucky, you get a slow increase in pressure. Um, going from the outside with a, a G probe, exactly the same. The problem we have with both of these is, of course, if there's a whole lot of fluid in the way, if there's fluid in, interposed between the sclera and the uveal tissue, then you're not going to get that contact. In exactly the same way, the retina doctors can't get that retinal detachment to close unless they can get the two tissues opposed. Um, so, uh, in terms of treatment, look, I mean, you know, whatever causes coagulation. So, um, I would say the, um, the, the, la the argon laser treatment that you shouldn't do for a PI, which is your 0.1 seconds um, and your sort of 100 micron spot size. Um, you know, if you're going to do a PI, you either do a contraction burn, which is low power, long duration, large spot, or you do a, a punch or chip burn, which are the, you know, very short duration, high power. Um, if I'm going to laser this, I'd probably use something in between. So 100, 200 mi uh, 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 micron spot size, um, probably about 0.1 uh, seconds and a high power, you know, around 800 to, to 1200 milliwatts, because you're trying to create a coagulated damage to the eye. The reason I don't like using those settings for iris um, PIs is that I don't want to create coagulative damage. I just want to chip out the tissue. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, anything that causes a coagulative damage is what you're trying to achieve. And, uh, um, you know, we all, we all do what, what works in our hands, I think. Perfect. Okay. So just want you to draw the audience attention to that 30 and 32. And if we look at point number three, all papers, and certainly now experience, and we've already alluded to it, that there's a spike in pressure after cleft is closed. And the theory is it's likely due to restoration of aqueous production by a ciliary body, but there's a lag behind for a recovery of the trabecular meshwork. And these are usually treated with uh, topical drops and diamox, but avoid myotics. You don't want to open up the cleft. So still within the realms of managing small clefts, We've looked at argon laser versus surgery. We're going to move on to cryo versus surgery. But before we do, we're going to talk about the surgery itself. Um, and I'm just going to let this run on. It's uh, a, I, I was trying to find a video of me closing a cleft, but it, it must be in my 
home in London because I couldn't find it on the, my computer. So very kindly, Rajan gave us this video, which he did with Keith Barton a few years ago. And essentially, this is something called direct cyclopexy. And the beauty of direct cyclopexy is you've got view. And in direct approach, you're doing it blindly, mind the pun, and you might be causing trauma. But anyway, and this is uh, especially for Yair and Sue, if they're watching, this is why I always tell you record videos. So essentially what you're doing is you identified the, the cleft. Um, you are then doing a pyritomy, 0.5 clock hours either side of the cleft. You're making a lamellar incision to 50% uh, of sclera. And once you've done that, you go all the way down to uvea and to your nose to nose with ciliary body. I love this video because it shows beautifully the cleft. And the pr now, that, now what you're doing, the principles will be, is suturing the ciliary body under direct visualization to the undersurface of the deep scleral flap onto the scleral spur. So Rajan, do you want to comment a little bit more about this beautiful video? Yeah, sure. Um, I think, uh, as you've said, the, the key is you can see the eye is very soft. So I would put helon inside the eyes we've talked about. You use a 70 silk traction suture. Um, with um, Keith used a, a 30, ga uh, 30 degree blade um, to make his initial incision. Um, you can use a diamond knife. The problem with the diamond knife is often you don't get feedback with the diamond knife and you can go too deep to start with, hence using the 30 degree blade. Um, the other thing is that you wanna have two flats so you can suture them separately um, because what can happen is if you close the, if you create only one flap, and you close it with a 10 nylon as we do for tramps, that as the pressure rises, it can cause the tenos to snap and break. So that's why you create two flaps. The, the lower flap, you close with an 8 nylon, which is much stronger and higher tensile strength. And then the upper flap, the more superficial flap, you close with a 10 nylon. And as you can see, you use a, a, a box suture going from out to in. You can use a double-ended if you want, but this was a single-ended suture. And as Gerd just mentioned that you can see the cleft directly and you can close it directly. And the other thing is that often these clefts can be multiple and interrupted in a region. And that's the advantage of doing direct closure because you can see one, two, three, four clefts in that area. Thank you. Now, those who, who know and worked with me know that I like uh, sort of taking on challenges and difficult cases, but of course this looks rather fiddly. Um, and those of us who've closed clefts before know it's not a, a straightforward uh, a surgery and you need a bit of time. So an alternative approach is an abexterner approach where you give contiguous applications two to three millimeters beyond the limbus of cryo. Now the advantage of which is um, you do, it doesn't damage sclera. The disadvantage is A, most of us are not used to using cryo and B, um, it's not as successful uh, uh, cryo alone compared to viti cryo. So Elena, can I just ask your opinion? We've looked at the model of medicine giving it time. After medicine hasn't worked, what's your thought process in terms of moving on to argon laser cryo or directly to surgery? Exactly. So medicine, as I said, I start super early on. I even give some steroids just in case they, they help. My, uh, the next thing I do very early on is argon laser because it's not invasive. You can do it in the office in adults. Uh, you cannot really hurt much with the argon laser. So I do that pretty early on as well. So I watch, I see how they do medically, and I have a low threshold to start argon laser. To do cryo, I wait a little bit more because that means a trip to the operating room that is it's pretty simple to do i have quite an experience when i did my first residency in spain in 2003 but um we did um it's very inflammatory so it's not a it's nice because you don't have to open the eye there's no risk of endothalmitis but it's um you know it is pretty inflammatory and the pa patients have quite a bit of discomfort afterwards uh, if things don't resolve, and depending on the size of the cleft as well, what I would uh, choose is to do a, a, a direct suturing. I have never done like endoscopic laser for this, which is, I mean, it's, it's a good point. But, yeah. Perfect. Okay, so we'll look into that in, in, in the next section, actually, because what I wanted to uh, uh, draw attention to was the, this paper, which essentially starts to give us some idea of sizing. What it showed is that Patients with uh, clefts less than 1.5 clock hours, they did better in terms of successful treatment with cryo, 
those between 1.5 and 4, they did better and more likely to be successful with surgery, right? So let's get those numbers in our mind, 1.5 and 4, right? So 1.5 and 4, what are our options for larger clefts? Now, the issue with doing um, surgical cyclopexy in patients with four, greater than four clock hour clefts is you might get anterior segment ischemia. Furthermore, we've said trauma is a very important etiology of clefts. So you might get concomitant retinal trauma, including vitreous hemorrhages and retinal detachments. So those are the biggest indications for trying to close the eye, um, cl uh, close the cleft by a vitrectomy. As we've said, you've got two tissues disinserted. So essentially what you're trying to do is restore normal anatomy by apposition, whether you do that from outside in or inside out, those are the different options. Now this paper showed that in pa patients with multiple clefts or large clefts or even uh, cyclodialysis, um, despite using silicone oil or air, even up to two years in patient number four, all of these patients, once the cleft was closed, they got better vision and the cleft got closed and the pressure got uh, higher. So I just want to draw the attention to point number three. Now, boys love their toys. So I love having loads of options in theatre. And in the Oxford uh, Hospital, we've got access to the uh, ECP, the endoscopic laser, which uh, myself and CK Patel, we like using quite a bit. So outside the cleft environment, so forget the cleft for the moment, but just managing glaucoma patients, I want to get the panel's opinion on whether A, they have access to endo laser and what patients and uh, what's the indications for doing FACO ECP, for example. Can we start off with Elena moving up to Paul? Let's start with Paul. I think Elena's being uh, <laughs> occupied. <laughs> I do I have say, access so, uh, to endo laser. I just have never personally used it. I mean, I think it's a good idea. And now, like, uh, I think it's one of the good things, like, of you doing this uh, webinar. I probably would think it again. To me, sometimes getting the patient to the operating room to do something that I'm, I'm going to go in from inside of the eye, sometimes it means uh, fixing and, and doing the, the PEXI, like, like same as uh, uh, Mr. Taylor uh, has shown uh, the, the video. But uh, yeah, I do have laser. I have no experience fixing a cleft with this, but it's perfect. So, so Paul, can you answer my question about using ECP in a yeah. non cleft non-trauma setting? So, you know, the indication for FACO ECP is that um, you've got an endo laser in the room and uh, you want to give it a try. And usually <laughs> after um, a few months when you realize it's pretty underwhelming, uh, you stop doing that and do something else. I mean, you know, the the problem with endo laser is that you know if you want a diode to work um you need to diode the pars plana not the pars placata because diode works by creating ischemia i mean that's what most people don't realize because we think we're actually you know knocking off those little um those little um ciliary processes i remember when i was doing my fellowship i had a uh, aneritic patient um, and uh, I thought, well, let's do some um, argon laser, all the ciliary processes that I can see. And I diligently did it all. It didn't do much at all. Um, <laughs> and that's when Roger Hitchings told me, well, you know, you've got to treat the fast planner if you want to make it work. So, you know, I think as a pressure lowering uh, mechanism, if you've got very mild glaucoma, then lots of things help the pressure, including taking out the cataract. Um, if you've got bad glaucoma, you need another treatment. However, however, if you're going to uh, treat a cleft, then, you know, um, ECP is a great idea, um, particularly when, it, when it's combined with, as you said, those other retinal procedures, because this issue, you know, when you've got these really large um, cyclodialyses, you know, they are extremely difficult to, uh, to fix in the same way that, you know, giant retinal tears are difficult to fix. And I think it's, you know, given that this isn't our um, primary job anyway, I think, uh, you know, there's no, um, um, there's no um, pride lost in sending somebody with uh, this sort of size of a problem to a, to a retinal surgeon. Um, they're extremely good at, you know, making the eye pressure very high. Um, in fact, you know, they send us a lot of work. 
uh, <laughs> that way. And, um, you know, that it, it does need a sort of a whole of eye approach when you've got this, this larger problem. And as you said, often associated with the same problems going on in the back of the eye. Um, so, um, you know, gives the, gives the retinal guys a chance to work in the anterior segment. F feeding the retina surgeons, I like it, I like it. Rajan, I know <laughs> what you're going to say, but uh, can you, um, uh, can, I know what you're going to say, <laughs> but can you also give your opinion? Uh, so, for, uh, I, I don't actually use ECP much. Um, um, I, I think um, I like to do a procedure, but well, unfortunately, nothing is uh, predictable in glaucoma surgery. Um, however, some things are slightly more predictable than others, and one of my concerns with diode and ECP is inflammation and pressurize and unpredictability. So, I mean, I don't have much experience doing ECP, um, so I can't really comment on its use in non-cleft patients. I think in cleft patients, I mean, it's a great option because you can visualize the cleft, you can treat it directly, and, and, you, and you can even, you know, video, video your surgery, which is another advantage and great for teaching. So I think in that case, it may be a great option. And, and there, you know, Gerd is going to talk about other options in addition to these. And some people have used, you know, tension rings and all those things which Gerd will cover. But I mean, this is another intra uh, uh, cameral access to the cleft, which may be a good option. So I guess um, just to go back to the cleft section, there was actually a nice paper by Weiwei Zhu et al. What they did is they got trauma clefts and they kind of uh, distinguished those who had vitreous hemorrhages and retinal detachments. And in those patients, they had vitrectomies and those that didn't, and they did cy surgical cyclopexies, there were 52 eyes. Those that had vitrectomies, they also did another sclerostomy, put an endo laser in, and as well as giving an internal tamponade with oil and gas, they also did some laser, and that laser causes obviously fibrosis contraction. So you've got two mechanisms of tamponading the cleft. And actually they show that their success rates were quite similar in both groups. The only difference was there was subjectively higher pain in the Viti group, and there was a higher spike in pressure in the cyclopexy group. So there is an option of using um, EC, uh, uh, endo laser posteriorly, but also we can think about using it anteriorly in the cleft. Both case reports that I looked at were in children. This one is an eight-year-old girl who had a combined trabeculectomy and a trabeculotomy in the right eye, developed hypotony, was diagnosed with a 2.5 clock hour cleft. And what the, patient, what the authors did, they created a paracentesis, went in with the endo laser, and then they did diode lasers of 30 applications, both on the internal scleral surface and the external surface. Within nine months, the, the pressure normalized to up to 15. The vision was 20 over 80, but of course there was PCO and lens decentration. Conversely, Ganaraj used a different approach, which actually I've used before, um, in, in the sense that in it, they had a traumatic, um, vitrex, uh, traumatic cleft, as well as a vitreous hemorrhage in a four-year-old girl. They did a PPV and a used C3F8, but before, flu before fluid gas exchange, what they did was they created a paracentesis, put in the endo laser, and they used not the laser, but actually the endo view to then do a surgical cyclopexy guided where they're putting their suture. So they've got an approach where they're using a tamponade internally and externally. Um, now, I, uh, we did that at the Western under my old uh, mentor's uh, tutelage, uh, Faisal Ahmed, whereby we use that endo probe to aid closure of the cleft. And I think that's quite a, a very refined, nice approach. Um, not only can we do obviously endo laser, we can do traditional diode laser. And there's a couple of PACE reports showing uh, no post-op uh, procedure spike, but I just thought maybe they just burnt all the uh, ciliary processes at the same time. Um, but anyway, so now we are going to move into time to celebrate um, because we have now got a lot of evidence there. We're near the end and now we've got a thought process in our mind. This is a published flow diagram, which I'm gonna even make more simple because whatever I tell people who work with me is keep it simple. So keep it simple is to say, think about clock hours. Anything less than 1.5 clock hours, medicine, argon laser or cryo, depending on availability or your experience. Between 1.5 and four clock hours, cyclopexy, surgical cyclopexy, which we've shown a beautiful video. But beyond that, you're thinking about anterior segment ischemia. So then you need to feed your retina boys. 
by giving them an opportunity to do PPV and internal tamponade. Or also remember endoscopy, uh, an endoscopic approach, which is, which, which is beautiful, and boys will be boys. So just to summarize, I'm going to say any type of trauma, anything post FACO, think, and you've got hypotony, think clef, 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 clef. We've said wait a couple of months with medicine, depending on the case, and hypotenuse maculopathy is something to really consider. UBM is critical, and gonioscopy is not only is it critical in diagnosis, it can be useful in therapeutics as well. Less than four clock hours, direct surgical cyclopexy. Anything beyond that, thinking about vitrectomies um, and the, the use of ECP as well. So last night I was sort of doing a little bit of research, couldn't sleep much, and I thought, how, how am I going to research this topic? So I thought, how do I prepare? And I'm, the way I prepared uh, was to watch reruns of videos. So I'd like to acknowledge, um, I'd like to acknowledge Parkinson, Frost and Aspel for making me the, the brilliant host that I have been today. <laughs> but, uh, but in seriously, I'd really like to thank um, our panel of experts, uh, Rajan, Paul and Elena. It's been a, a pleasure to work with you guys and getting your thoughts and expertise from the four corners of the world has been fantastic. But of course, um, thank you so much for Maria to make this happen and all the uh, kindness and expertise behind, the, behind the, the scenes. Because of this hacking business, I've just put a, um, um, a, a little point at the top to say we've recorded this. We're going to make it available on Oxford Eye Surgery. Um, so everyone will have uh, an opportunity not only to see this, but also I'll put the resources up, the PowerPoint, the, the papers and the videos. And I'd like to keep you abreast of how this patient develops. So once I see him back in clinic, um, I'll feed back exactly what I did and whether I got uh, my, I dusted off my cryoprobe or not. Uh, next week's title is going to be fantastic. Uh, one of our friends, Alfonso, is going to talk about innovations in endothelial regeneration from Bascom Palmer. And we've got Greg and Audrey in the audience as well. So thank you all. And uh, we'll see you next time.